Today, Dr. Steve Salaita joins the Palestine Pod. And the Zionist narrative rests on the claim that every Jewish person is allegedly indigenous to Palestine. For Palestinians, indigeneity is self-evident. We right. were there until we were removed, and many of us are still there. It's a talking point. The Zionists on Twitter are saying, hey, we're the indigenous ones. Right. Right? Can I intertwine in Palestine anyway, indigeneity with any sort of sectarianism. It's completely ahistorical. Colonizers need to envision a new future requires him to invent a new past. You have to go to lab, you know, to try to get a scientist to confirm an old biblical story as your claim to habitation, then you have a shitty claim to habitation. That you saw that video of Jacob the settler. I don't know how anybody could look at that man, listen to him and not think he's indigenous to Palestine. Hello and welcome to episode 10 of the Palestine Pod, the weekly podcast where a Palestinian American lawyer and a Jewish American comedian break down the latest headlines dealing with Palestine and bring you stories, commentary, and interviews with the aim of spreading awareness about the Palestinian struggle for justice and equal rights. I'm one of your hosts, Lara E. You might know me from Instagram as at Gaz and Girl, and I'm joined by my co host, Mikey B. What's going on, y'all? Mikey B on TikTok here, Michael Scherzer on Instagram, and Mikey Intifada, if you saw that Settler Jacob video and thought he makes some good points. <laughs> Our guest today is a Palestinian American scholar who I personally have learned so much from, and I'm really excited that we're going to be in discussion with him. But before we get into today's episode, please like, comment, and subscribe if you're here on YouTube. If you're listening on a podcast app, subscribe and leave a review. It takes two minutes, but it does have a huge impact and allows our podcast to reach more people. As always, you can find our full episodes and sources at palestinepod.com. And if you ever want to get involved in the conversation, reach out to us at palestinepod at gmail.com. We might even read your email on air. And feel free to engage with us on our Instagram at the Palestine Pod. We'd love to hear from you. So today, Dr. Steve Salaida joins the Palestine Pod. Steve Salaida is an author, scholar, former academic, and activist for Palestinian rights. He completed his PhD at the University of Oklahoma in Native American Studies with an emphasis in literature, and his scholarship focuses on Native American studies, indigenous peoples more broadly, colonialism and decolonization, and questions of race, ethnicity, and multiculturalism, just to name a few of his specialties. He has authored numerous books, including Uncivil Rights, Palestine and the Limits of Academic Freedom, Internationalism, Decolonizing Native America and Palestine, Israel's Dead Soul, the Holy Land in Transit, and anti-Arab racism, where it comes from and what it means for politics today. Today, you can find his articles at stevesalida.com, where he regularly comments on the Palestinian struggle for freedom, amongst other events. Steve, welcome to the Palestine Pod. Thank you for having me. We so yeah. appreciate your time. I hope that was a good intro. I, that was wonderful. Thank okay. you. So let's get right into it. In your book, The Holy Land in Transit, you speak of how the U.S. and Israel are actually more than just strategic partners, but in reality, they are, quote, bound historically and philosophically in ways that run much deeper than conventional political expediency. In your other book, Internationalism, Decolonizing Native America and Palestine, you write, quote, without the idea of Palestine, North America might have been conquered in a much different fashion. And without that conquest, Israel might have been but a fleeting historical experiment. Can you perhaps start by elaborating on these notions, specifically the ways in which the early settlers in America viewed themselves and how Zionists drew inspiration from that? Yeah, sure. It's a complicated phenomenon, and there are a lot of different aspects uh, we can focus on. But what I've been concerned with is kind of the, the discourses of settler colonization in North America and Palestine, the ways that they've mutually reinforced one another across the Atlantic o over a time period of centuries. So if you start at the beginning of modern European colonization, you know, at the, the end of the um, 15th century, once you get to, you know, what we now know as the United States, particularly in, in New England with the, the Puritan settlers, especially, they were often speaking of, you know, North America as a holy land. They often spoke of the indigenous populations that they encountered as, as Canaanites or Amalekites or, or some other ancient biblical community. 
And so their errand was to conquer them. And, and they, they spoke of the land in terms of, you know, its abundance, its, its uh, godly propriety. It's a, it's a place of milk and honey. And of course, they're using all of this biblical language, Old Testament language in, in particular. And so the, the imaginary of, of a holy land has always been part of the U.S settler colonial project it's all over the early literature and i mean you can see it really sur surviving different epochs going all the way through the civil war up until today you know there's there's a constant reference being made to you know sort of a, 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 a divine purpose in the united states and you see it in secular spaces as well as religious so on the eve of zionism you know um four centuries later we can see that a lot of the early zionists took up a, a similar sort of language, even though they conceptualized their, their project as secular. It was secular in some sense, but you, you, you can't undertake to colonize somebody else's lands just based on a flight of fancy. There, there has to be a, a, a substance to the narrative to get people on board. And the substance of the narrative was a return, you know, a return to the biblical promise of a holy land for a particular population, in this case, the, the, the Jews of Europe. You know, I guess Jews all over the world, but they weren't really thinking about the ones in, in Africa and West Asia and, and so forth. You know, they, they really had in mind um, European Jews. And so they looked towards America, you know, the United States, um, the New World, whatever, as, as a source of inspiration. And they need, of course, Western backing. And they found that backing in the United States, right? Uh, particularly after 1967, they always had it. Harry Truman's uh, a devoted Zionist. He was a, a believer in, in, you know, in, in the, the, you know, the existence or the emergence of an Israeli state. But they did, they, they're speaking a language, and they still do it today. I, mean, I see it all over the place. We can go language of of shared values with the United States, and it sounds very familiar to the American's ear. Right, that we here we are in this hostile land. It's swampy, you know. It's um, inhospitable. It's it's half empty. The people who are here, you know, it's like some scattered savages who are who are doing all kinds of weird shit that we don't understand you know they're you know they're they're barbarians you know um and what we're gonna do you know with with a lot of industriousness and of course with a little bit of help from god is we, we're gonna right. turn this land into something right we're gonna make it profitable we're gonna make the land productive because the natives aren't aren't being productive on the land right they're they're just letting it sit there and 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 do nothing and you know what 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 what's worse for a, you know a settler colonial capitalist than you know a land lying fallow and 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 you know not not being developed in such a way as, as to be put into use for you know uh, the project of Western capital, mm -hmm. and so these narratives are deeply familiar to to the American ear. You know they've they've been effective when politicians you know U.S. politicians talk about shared values between the U.S. and Israel. They're not just talking about geopolitical values. They're really talking about the the values, the very basis of of each colony's uh, national identity, you know, the, the idea of, of having something do done, something extraordinary, of, of taming a wilderness, of, of building a modern state out of the, the wreckage of indigenous uselessness and indifference. So that's, that's kind of what I'm getting at. There's, there's a lot more to it and I'm talking too much, but um, that's- No, you're, I mean, I could listen to you go on. You can <laughs> feel no, free, no, no, I'll let you go. I'm not gonna cut you off. It's at the, the center of the, the notion of, of Israeli and US exceptionalism, right? Yes. That they're exceptional in a particular historical framework. Yes. Your answer was so engrossing, I forgot I was on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god yeah you know when you study the origins of the zionist movement you 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 learn that for a brief moment the zionists were considering plenty of other places for their settler colonial project we've heard references to uganda i i recently heard azerbaijan i didn't know that also madagascar um but i think strategically there was this idea that okay, we'll pick Palestine because of the ability yeah. to capitalize on this religiously infused discourse. And if I'm understanding you correctly, the Zionists were specifically inspired by what they saw in the U.S. In other words, the idea that settlement, which is driven by religious fanaticism, is in fact very effective uh, at achieving conquest. Absolutely. They were 
in the early Zionist literature, and even some of the early anti-Zionist literature, there's constant reference being made to, to the United States and what happened there. Not only in, in, with the idea of trying to bring the United States on board as, as an ally and as a sponsor, Right of Zionism, but you know, in, in in terms of working out some of the you know the philosophical difficulties of taking up a, a foreign settlement project, there, there you know, the United States was a, a a source of of great inspiration. There was also, for a brief moment in time, an attempt by certain Zionists to integrate into Palestine. So, for example, Ben Gurion, twenties and thirties, he tried to integrate into the Ottoman system. He even tried to learn Arabic, and this, of course, is not how the story ends because we know that it quickly turned to removal and replacement of the indigenous population as soon as it had the power to do so. But is there anything similar in the history of early settlement in America, or was it conquest from day one? I guess when we speak of the similarities, or, or you know, not just similarities, points of comparison uh, between um, settlement in in North America and Palestine, it's probably useful to 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 acknowledge that there are tons of differences. I mean, the North American landscape is just vast. And, and you know, Palestine, you know, e even from the river to the sea, as the, that grand phrase has it, it's, it's still tiny, right? You know, it may, from the river to the sea makes it sound much bigger than it, than it actually is. It's a sliver of land in the... Eastern Mediterranean, and 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 so you're going to get um, dynamics in both the past and present that 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 simply don't hold to to what happened or what's capable of happening in North America or really the entire so-called New World, right? Uh, both continents. But I I don't think that besides some scattered diplomatic attempts and some attempts from what you could say more. Um, you know, more more open-minded colonists in, in North America. There was no systemic effort to compromise or, or accommodate or, or to put into practice what in the Palestine context we would call binationalism. That simply didn't exist. There were different attempts, of course. You know, they, I mean, they, they, they signed a bunch of treaties, the U.S. federal government with uh, various native nations. And, you know, they set different borders. They, uh, you know, they created reservations. They did all kinds of things. You know, granted special access for certain native nations to, to certain landscapes. But there was, there was never really a sense of... of wanting to coexist right in the in the way that that that, that we see among um, one staters or, or or binationalists in 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 the Palestine context what did happen in in North America is there were programs of assimilation government sponsored programs of assimilation that were remarkably violent but there was never a sense of uh, or never a systemic desire to incorporate natives as natives Right, in, into the fabric of, of of mainstream U.S. society, that would happen much later, of course. You know, with the you know the, in the mid century, at the time of the civil rights movement and so forth. But the general sensibility was, you know, uh, save the man and kill the Indian. Right? Uh, in other contexts and other geographies, it was to slaughter the Indian. In other contexts, it was just to get rid of them, and then we don't care what happens to them after that. But, uh, you know, there, there was never, from the beginning of Zionism, there was always a, a version of binational Zionism, right? Uh, and, you know, there, there's, of course, uh, right. binationalism isn't associated in any way with Zionism today, right? Like, if you're a binationalist, you're not really a Zionist. It, people aren't really squaring that circle that was kind of a first half of the 20th century phenomenon. I, Noam Chomsky was one, for example. But, right. Um, you know, that, that I, I can't think of anything comparable that, that was happening in the United States. Something which I think is is striking is the ways that Zionists manipulate notions of time to advance their agenda. So on the one hand, the Zionist narrative rests on the claim that every Jewish person is allegedly indigenous to Palestine if we just go back to 2,000 years ago. And that this, in fact, somehow entitles any Jewish person from anywhere in the world today to show up in Palestine and receive immediate citizenship, move into a Palestinian home or on Palestinian land, and participate in this ongoing policy to uproot Palestinians from their homes and create this mythical Jewish state. For Palestinians, indigeneity is self-evident. We were there until we were removed, and many of us are still there, even if we're living as internal refugees. So, for example, 80% of Gaza is people who were removed from what became Israel in 1948. My family happens to be from the Gazans who were originally from Gaza, although my great-grandmother was from Yaffa, but the majority of Gazans today are actually internal refugees. Can you help us understand these competing claims by defining indigeneity for us and 
helping us understand why the argument that Jews are indigenous to Palestine really misses the mark when it comes to providing a basis for uh, the justification of the Zionist project in Palestine today. Yeah, sure. That's I mean that's a complicated question. I mean the the the, the you know the, the concept of indigeneity in general is 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 deeply contested, and so you know I'm gonna I'm gonna end up pissing off somebody. Um, I, I, I hope it ends up being Zionists and 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 not not people I like, but yeah, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll do my best. <laughs> we piss off that's a lot of Zionists on this podcast, so feel <laughs> free. That's kind of what this is all about. <laughs> Listen to us. We were number fifteen on their political charts in Israel. Yeah, um, that's good. All right, yeah. you know that, that's true because they, you know, they, they're definitely always watching, and so you know, yes. you, you want to make an impression. Um, yeah, I think a lot of our fans are intelligence. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that's uh, I think a lot of the the comments and stuff we get come yeah. straight out of occupied Palestine. <laughs> I, one of these days, I'm I'm. I'm going to look for the the easiest kind of work there 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 is, which is just to shit post on Twitter and and on on uh, YouTube and get paid for it. This is yeah. this is amazing that that's an economy in in, yes. in Israel. Right? I mean, you know, wow. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> it's it's a livable wage. Yeah, <laughs> they get healthcare. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's it's a pretty sweet deal. <laughs> Transitioning to indigeneity, oh, it's 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 complicated because i'm just going to stick to palestine um, yeah. there, there are all, all kinds of, of of meanings to indigeneity and, and indigenousness in in north america and south america you know south asia other parts of the world wait right? so in palestine the multi-confessional aspect of it uh, really complicates people's notions of indigeneity it's it's clear to me as i'm sure it is to you too that uh you know that uh, that it's a talking point that some Zionist institution and it, some reason, I mean, you're not even talking about we're indigenous for a while, but it seemed to come out of nowhere all at the same time. All of a sudden, like all the Zionists on Twitter are saying, Hey, we're the indigenous ones. Right. Right? Then they got a few, then they got a few Arabs, right. Uh, doing the same. They always a few Arabs who, who, who come in and say, you know what? <laughs> I've just decided, you know, I used to, I used to love Hamas. I used to, <laughs> I used to be, or I used to really be into uh, armed resistance, but I realized that all that stuff is stupid, you know. Right. And what I need to do is move into the future and look yeah. to the future and just forget about the past, you know, and make peace, you know, with my Israeli brothers and sisters, <laughs> yes. and, and then quit all this uh, resistance nonsense. So there's always, you know, like two or three of those all Muslim right. Zionists. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always, you know, yeah. they, they. They probably getting paid, but I bet they're not getting the healthcare. But anyhow, um, <laughs> they're Arabs, you know, and then they, they probably get right. paid at a 60% rate. Right. And, um, <laughs> um, so it, it happened, right? Because we've been flooded for what, like the last two, three months with this indigeneity, Jewish yes. indigeneity discourse. And I mean, obviously it's, it's especially practice. Especially in the liberal Zionist circles, right? Correct. Yes. They're, they're, they're definitely trying to attach it to a sort of a leftish... What pe- I don't want to use the word woke. <laughs> if the CIA can use the word woke, so can you for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if they if they're you know they're 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 definitely attaching it to you know to, uh, somehow to the left, right? To maybe what you yeah. would call disparagingly or not, um, I really have no opinion. What you could call the identitarian left. If you can make a claim for being indigenous then you get uh special dispensations in the discourse and i think that that's what they're going after. yeah because but, indigeneity I mean, indigeneity provokes sympathy yes exactly yeah you know you, you're not a, if you're indigenous you're not a settler colonizer right exactly you, you all of a sudden occupy a completely different category which has moral but implications it, it, Exactly. I mean, as does the term indigeneity itself. It has tons of moral implications, political implications, legal implications, economic implications, especially in the United States, right? We have tribes uh, that are trying to get federal recognition because federal recognition comes with, with material benefits that they're seeking. Anyway, it, I like to look at it in, instead of uh, getting mad, which is what I normally do. I'd say that we should take it. Uh, it people who are Palestinian, who identify as Palestinian, or, or people, you know, who... who are interested in Palestine, whatever their their ethnic or religious background, should take it as an opportunity then to to explore our relationship, you know, to the term and and to the history and to understand 
really um, what what it is that, that they're trying to say and how it puts our, our own claims and our own rights into better focus, because that's what it does in the end. We have the opportunity to, to, to take that discourse, you know, to, to analyze it, to put a set of, of realistic historical claims to it that completely undermine it and that, and that end up um, strengthening our position. First of all, they're imagining to some degree a, a homogenous Palestinian society that, 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 that has nothing to do with Judaism and nothing could be further from the truth. So when we're talking about, from our point of view, you know, Palestinian indigeneity, we're not talking about uh, Muslim majority indigeneity, right? Or Muslim majority Christian minority indigeneity. We're talking indigeneity in the sense of people who have a biological and cultural history in the land, right? And an, and an attendant attachment to that land. And those people have come from all kinds of faith traditions. The majority have been Muslim ever since, you know, um, the seventh century, but um, they've been Christian, they've been Jewish, they've been Druze, you know, they've been Baha'i, they've they've been atheists, right? <laughs> you know, they've been people who don't, identify, who don't identify with religion at all. And so we cannot intertwine in Palestine anyway, indigeneity with any sort of sectarianism. It's completely ahistorical. It doesn't work. It's nonsensical. Palestinians have have never excluded uh, Jewish human beings or Jewish identity from our notions of indigeneity. There there has been no attempt to expunge notions of Christianity from from Palestinian indigeneity. And in fact, anybody who has spent any time in in, Pal in any part of Palestine, not just Jerusalem and and, and Bethlehem. And, you know, in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip, right? Uh, you know, in 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 the desert, not even in 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 Nasra or the Galilee, you'll see that you know imagery of of Jesus is is such a huge part of Palestinian cultural identity, right? Not just in terms of 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 his existence as you know as a as a prophet in Islam or right as as the God of of, of the Christians, but as a Palestinian. Right, yeah. somebody who was part of that landscape. So this is part of Palestinian indigeneity. So it's it's never been a, a, a sectarian identity. It can't be a sectarian identity. People have tried. Nobody's right. harder than the Zionists, but it just doesn't match to the experiences that Palestinians of multiple faith and and cultural and economic backgrounds right have actually lived. Yeah, you it's know, just not consistent with history. Exactly. Uh, I got that from your book because oh, okay. there's another line there's another line from internationalism that's related to this point and that is that this notion of mythologized history so so you write quote the colonizers need to envision a new future requires him to invent a new past. It, exactly. That's yeah. it. Yeah. I'm I'm glad I wrote that. Um, I, I don't remember <laughs> writing it but I'm glad I did. I, that was a, you have so that was many a good, good line. Yeah, that's a good one. <laughs> He no, said, that's a bar. Yes. <laughs> now I'm going to have to quote myself. You know, again, they're, they're working on an assumption that comes from, from their own philosophy as settler colonizers, that not only does it have to be sectarian, that it has to be exclusive. You know, that, that it's, it's kind of an all or right. nothing thing that a Jew anywhere, you know, can conceptualize themselves as, as indigenous to, to Palestine based on a specific story. But I mean, I, I, I'm deeply, deeply skeptical of, of you know, uh, following, you know, uh, the work of, of Kim Tallbear and, and others, of, of genetics as a source of uh, political claims. I, I'm like you, Lara. You know, it, look, we were there. We were there. You know, in the 20th century. It's simple. That's the thing is like exactly. Zionists always complicate the issue and they, exactly. and they try to confuse you. And, and the reality is we were just there. All four of my grandparents were born in Gaza and, and, and their parents were either born in Yaffa or Gaza. And, you know, my, my grandfather tells me stories about how he used to take the train from Gaza to Damascus because there were no borders. Yeah. You know? And I just, I'm, 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 Thinking about this past that he lived, that for me sounds like a mythical future, you know, yeah. some sort of like a future with no colonialism where everybody can just move uh -huh. and there's no borders. And it existed in the past. But for, but for me, it's sort of like this imagination, you know, it's like in my imagination as what the future could be. Right. Exactly. That's, yeah, that's, 
that that's kind of the the you know the the vision of the future that I'm always attracted to, right? One when we're you know where people are free to move because the, you know the landscapes or you know, the the nation states, let's say, there are so small, and it's it's a tragedy that people who have been so historically connected are now systemically disconnected, you know, from each other. You know, what what is Gaza to to Beirut? You know, what's I don't know, I man. I, I have no, I don't know exactly, but what is that? It's like driving from like DC to Philadelphia. I mean, you know, it's it's close. It's it's right there. Um, and you know, it's easier to get from Miami to Seattle, you know, than 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 it is just to go up the Mediterranean coast. But um, I mean, one thing that that I do want to add, uh, uh, you know, to the conversation, for the, if that's okay, about indigeneity, is that that a, a, again with the you know, with the usual skepticism about, um, you know, genetic claims, you know, are, or using genetics as, uh, you know, as a substitute for modern political claims, because it's something settler colonizers always do. They do it in North America too, right? Like, oh, well, you know, the Indians only got here, you know, 6,000 years ago, you know, so are they really indigenous? You know, they, so they're always, you know, trying to uncover archaeologies that, that would sort of uh, deflate, you know, uh, native claims, you know, to, 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 to their, to their land. But anyhow, you know, or to their nationhood, but um, the populations of, of of ancient Palestine, you know, in the time period in question, you know, the these these the Old Testament book of, of Joshua narrative that, that provides the philosophical basis for Zionism, you know, it, it, it doesn't actually cohere to what ancient Israel was. There's some scattered places in in the West Bank, what they call Judea and Samaria, that, that that's the bulk of the ancient Israelite kingdom. On the coast, there were Canaanites who were a Phoenician population, right? And again, I don't want to go, go, go fine tune it, but what happened over the centuries is that these these there were admixtures of of these populations, and those admixtures created what we know as an Arabic speaking modern Palestinian community. I'm not taking any DNA tests. You know, I ain't handed my I did. I actually did. did. No, <laughs> say, but, because if you're talking about the, the ancient Israelites, that's us. Yeah. That's us. Yeah. The, the Muslims who conquered yeah. in the seventh century, that's us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? The 12 apostles, that's us. Right? That all of these 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 paths came You're giving me chills. I'm like <laughs> <laughs> tell me, tell me about your. Uh, tell me about your. Uh... Well, so I did the twenty three and Me test, and uh -huh. um, it's definitely anti Palestinian because it said like eighty percent, uh, you know, Arab, close to Beirut. But correct, you know, they right? don't name Palestine. They anyway. don't name Palestine. But what I found very interesting was that there was an eleven percent that they identified as being Greek, and I, of course, don't have anyone in my family that I know is Greek. But of course, Greeks were in Palestine. Makes perfect sense. It makes yep. perfect sense. Exactly. Exactly. That's all. you know the Nabataeans, the Greeks, the Phoenicians, the the, the Persians, everybody. You know, it, and that's how history works. And settler colonizers can't understand that because they they using an exclusivist sectarian logic, right, to make uh you know to make specific claims, uh, you know, for themselves only, for you know, from which everybody else is going to be excluded. But not, that's not how the present should work, and that's certainly not how history works. You know, God knows what's in our backgrounds, but the point is, whatever is in our backgrounds. Right, we were there. We had an established nation, right, with a, a, a vast agricultural network and urban centers, sophisticated urban centers, and we were kicked off our land in 1948. Then again, in 1967, we've been kicked off ever since. And and there is no disputing that. And if you have to go, you know, if you have to go to, you know, to, to a lab. You know, to try to get a scientist to to, to confirm an, an old biblical story as your claim to habitation, then you have a shitty claim to habitation. My claim to habitation is my grandmother lived there. You know who really, really loved the science of Jewish DNA? Nazis. Big fans. I won't let you say that one, Michael. But but that's always the that's always the danger, isn't it? Right? You, yeah. when, when you start making biological claims, you know, to resources, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. Then because I, you know, there are tiny elements of that in 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 certain Palestinian nationalist communities, but it's really not part of, of Palestine's national movement. There's not this sense that we're gonna very narrowly define who's Palestinian, right? And and kick everybody else the hell out. And and you know, no, there there's you know, there's a much broader sense that look, we're gonna create a democratic nation. Right. And, and, and are we going to take away this notion of, of biology as defined from above, as defined by the state, as, as a mode of citizenship? And I, and I think, you know, that's the aspiration anyway.
My grandfather tells me that, uh, you know, he was growing up as a kid in Palestine. Anybody who lived on the land of Palestine, spoke Arabic and, you know, worked in, uh, in collaboration with their neighbor was Palestinian. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't like this exclusive club. Anybody could be Palestinian as long as you had respect for the land and that you integrated into the community. Exactly. You know, there's, there's no need to make it any more complicated than that. I've been, I've been thinking about the concept of indigeneity, especially since it came up in the Palestine discourse. Uh, and often just because I'm a white male in a society that is grappling with its sins of the past. Right. And so I think in addition to using indigeneity as a claim for legitimizing displacement, legitimizing ethnic cleansing, it comes from an identity crisis where you would otherwise have to grapple with your own sins, your own participation in a settler colonialist system. Right. And I understand many Jews fled the Holocaust, some of my family as well. They're still settlers, though. We, the, the family history is that we settled in Brooklyn. We settled in Toronto, right? Those are the terms that my family has always used. It's absolving oneself of guilt. It's absolving oneself of any responsibility for the atrocities that took place on the land that we now occupy. Yeah. That's extremely well said. Oh, thank you. I'm woke as hell. What's up? <laughs> uh, I want to. I want to go to this next. I I'm sure, Steve, that you saw that outrageous video of Jacob the settler uh, explaining why he just had to steal this Palestinian woman's house in East Jerusalem earlier this week, and it reminded me of how you write in Internationalism how for Andrew Jackson, the settler's desire for the land is just as strong as that of the native, and how the white settlers in America treated violence of modernity as extraneous to their own agency. So this notion that this violence is inevitable, it's going to happen whether you like it or not, it's not from me, it's, you know, it's, it's this force that's greater than me, and that's exactly what Jacob the settler was doing when he said, if I don't take it, someone else will. So what are you complaining about? Exactly. And, and Jacob had an extremely American sensibility, right? You know, and, and you notice that... And the, the accent. And I, exactly. Anybody gets a chance or has been to, to Palestine. Um, you know, I went with a group like years ago, like two decades ago, and we, we, you know, we visited a settlement, you know, to, you know, interview a settler and you listen to them, you know, like on YouTube or on Twitter or whatever. And the, the American ones have a specific sensibility, don't they? They um, they sound a, a, a very familiar way, and that's those shared values that I'm talking about. And and for Jacob, the the messianism that he was expressing is second nature to him. See, it's easy for him to say that. Look, this is going to happen. Right? It's not going to happen because I'm an asshole. It's going to happen because that's what history necessitates. There's nothing we can do about it. There is a, a march of forward progress. Right? Sucks for you, Palestinian, but uh, this is the way that God and, and history have intended it. And so, you know, uh, sorry that you were born, you know, in, in, into the wrong community, but this is just the way that, that it's going to have to be. That's the way that it's yeah. been ordained. There's a, a sense of predestination there, you know, and, and, and it completely absolves him in his mind you know, ethically and morally of, of the horrible, horrible thing that, that he's doing. I don't know how anybody could look at that man, listen to him and not think he's indigenous to Palestine. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that right there. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's, that's, I, Jacob, the settler, you know, that's kind of the imagery I get when I think of indigeneity, you know, just see of that. But you know what was Picture. good about the video? There's nothing good about the video, but what was good about the video is that, that you know, let's say that you're the, that, uh, you know, the neutral observer of, of legend, right? I, I don't know if there's a such thing as a neutral observer, but we always imagine that there is. How are you not going to empathize with the Palestinian? No, there's absolutely zero that is likable about Jacob the Settler. You're going to watch that video and say, you know, that this guy is, 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 is a complete, asshole and if if i'm even minimally human i'm going to take the side of the people that he's very clearly abusing 
in this video that, that he's stealing from right out in the open and he's doing it brashly uh, as if he's proud of it, you know. The Western frontier used to be like Texas, Kansas, you know, California. Now it's Palestine. Exactly. They, the American frontiersmen have just moved to Palestine to colonize. There was South Africans who lost their, you know, plantations and they converted to Judaism and moved to Palestine to start colonizing the West Bank. And those are some of the most aggressive yep. settlers, right? They walk around with guns, they fire it at people, they terrorize people's lands, etc. Those are the most brazen and disgusting. Not that there's like a great version of a colonizer, you know what I mean? But like they are the most dangerous. Yeah. I loved her response. Her response was nobody has to take my house. Wait. Yeah, I'm me. Yeah, I'm me. Yeah. <laughs> she was even making a joke. Like, bro. I was going to say dude. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Nobody has to take my house, dude. Like something like that. Yeah, so I, obviously watching the videos of these Sheikh Jarrah expulsions is really jarring. And I'm always shocked by just the matter-of-factness of these settlers. Obviously, to me and to anyone with a sense of humanity, stealing someone's house is a great crime. And I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, imagine trying to do it yourself. I mean, how awful, how shameful. How do you even go about it? I don't personally understand how these settlers are, are, are able to to live with themselves. But you write in one of your books that in the colonial imagination, ethnic cleansing is not a calamity. Right. Rather, allowing the native to wither in his primordial sensibilities would be the true catastrophe. That's right. You know, your, your reaction, it, you know, is deeply human, you know, to, to the events in, in, in Sheikh Jarrah. Other people's reactions as well. It's deeply human, deeply humane, because you're not possessed of... of a sense of history that excludes every other human being in the world but yourself. And <laughs> that's what it comes down to. It's, at an interpersonal level, it's, it's a profound form of, of narcissism. But at a, a political level, you, how can you do something like what Jacob the Settler is doing without God? Yeah, you can't do it without God. Right. There, there has to be a, a notion of, of theology there that, that's driving that behavior. The notion that not not only do you, you know you're not doing something bad, but you're actually doing something great, or at the very least something important or necessary. Right? That to allow such a, a backwards culture as as the Palestinians to flourish, right, or even to allow it any space in the first place is is a kind of sin. Not just a sin against God, but it's a sin against history. It's a sin against society. You're not going to make the world any any better by humoring this caliber of person that you know you, you have to you have to push forward and and make progress and and bring history to an end. Right? That we we can no longer that that we're on a sort of a forward march. Right, a, a predestination, and we're going to hit that stopping point, and ugly things are going to happen along the way, but they're not really ugly because the the ending is going to make up for it all. Yeah, the ends justify the means. Can you imagine looking at that dude in a Target white T-shirt and sweatpants and thinking he's going to bring about civilization? Yeah. <laughs> this <laughs> this dude is here to civilize me. Yeah. <laughs> You know, we talk a lot about Zionist logic on this podcast, how Zionists invert logic and rationality and then demand acquiescence to their vision of what is logical, even if it defies all notions of acceptable human behavior, at least in theory. Um, and, and you've also written about this, saying that it's the destiny of all settler colonial states to be fundamentally irrational. And when I read that, I said, wow, he's got Zionist logic in mind. Of course, that was the name of the article that Malcolm X penned uh, following his trip to Palestine, uh, yeah. where he argued that, that Zionist has no rational basis for, for its existence or for the claim to the land of Palestine. Yeah, it's kind of a, an, an inverse of, of what we would normally consider logical. So in my writing, I like to play around with the, the, the word logical. Yeah. You know, it's, it's supposed to be a good word, but actually in the, in the context of, 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 you know, colonial political systems, um, you know, the, the, the logical is also deeply violent. You right. know, the, the logical doesn't doesn't follow a, a, what we would consider maybe a humane trajectory. That it's it's a, a deeply self serving logic, a, a logic of accumulation and a logic of conquest. And so we ought to be wary of what 
self-proclaimed pragmatists put forward as, as logical. And we, we should always think really, really carefully about these kinds of terminologies. It's rational, it's logical, it's pragmatic. It's it, for whom? Yeah, and exactly. What end? You know, let's 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 sit with this for a little while and let's think about it for a little while and let's think about who's being excluded and whether their exclusion is purposeful or not. It's going to be. And what's the desired endpoint here? You know, so I, I, I'm always, always skeptical or, you know, or try to be skeptical of, of, of terms that try to universalize a social or, or economic or political phenomenon, you know, because uh, what's, what's, you know, logical to the Zionists certainly isn't going to be logical to, to the Palestinian and, and Zionist logic itself, really, what, what, what is it? Even philosophy as a branch of study is exclusionary, right? Where logic derives from. Yeah. It comes from the Greeks, you know, ancient, like old, like white property owning males still the people who were able to access that education would have access to philosophy, logical fallacies, etc. They'd be able to argue in such a way that it creates a buffer, a lawyer force, right? People who uphold the law. And even that is exclusionary, right? Because not everybody has access to law school. Not everybody is going to be a lawyer. Some people are just subject to the law. They are not participating in it. Exactly. Yeah, we, he always makes the, the joke on this podcast that, that he's the Jew, but I'm the lawyer. <laughs> it's his joke. But I it's used a great it. joke. One of the other elements of uh, Zionist colonization of Palestine, which is shared by the U.S. vis-a-vis uh, -vis its own history, is also this total indifference that the violence and damage and brutality that is caused should be worthy of reparation. That if you take something, you should at least pay for it. And you have written about how your maternal grandmother's home was taken by Zionist forces in Ayn Karam outside of Jerusalem in 1948, and that she has never been compensated, nor has her loss ever even been acknowledged by Israel. And you also write about how property losses of Palestinians since 1948 can be placed at $146 billion, and that lost income of Palestinians represents more than $300 billion. And discussions of reparations for slavery in the United States are often met with this sort of bewilderment or attempts to excuse any form of compensation for this brutality. And in the case of Native Americans, there were historically, correct me if I'm wrong, some very inadequate reparations in the form of the Indian mm -hmm. Claims Commission, which mm -hmm. awarded meager sums to Native Americans. But this, of course, is nothing compared to the damage that was done. So, for example, you write about how 10 million natives were slaughtered in the lands that are north of the Rio Grande, and that in the Americas, the number may be as high as 100 million. You also write about how Native America occupies today 4% of the United States, which of course was all Native land at one point. Yep. So what do you think explains this resistance to reparation that we see by both the US and Israel alike? And, and where does reparations fit into the broader question of liberation and decolonization, whether for Black Americans, Native Americans, or Palestinians? Are reparations insufficient when we should be prioritizing things like restitution are they you know a part of liberation where how should we understand this notion i i think that they are are insufficient yes which isn't to say that they should not be pursued they can they can offer relief or at least some relief they 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 put the issue into the spotlight and and make people confront a certain ugly histories that maybe they don't want to confront so you know, I, I'm certainly not against reparations, and certainly when it comes to Black Americans, there's a, an extremely sophisticated discourse uh, and analysis around uh, reparations, and and I, um, you know, I, I I concede to that, and you know what, you know, and and put myself in a position to you know to support whatever emerges from that community. Same with uh, Native Americans. But in the end, um, when we're talking settler colonization, you know, I, I don't think that, that reparations is generally a, a, a panacea. We have to think about what kind of reparations we're talking about. Um, is it monetary reparations? You know, you know, this is like just what a huge geopolitical version of, of torts. You know, I was fired from an academic job, um, you know, like seven years ago. I, I ended up uh, winning a settlement. You know, it was... Okay, people's ideas. Okay, he's been made whole, right? That's the term that they always use, made whole. But I've never felt whole. I, I would not trade any amount of, of money for the career I lost. I missed that career. 
you know, you can't just give me a pile of money and 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 think everything's going to be fine, you know. It, 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 so that that's what I was thinking about in terms of reparation, in terms of my grandmother, and in, in terms of others who have have been displaced. Um, I think also of of you know the 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 Lakota, you know, and they've been offered uh, hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, after a court in in 1980, 1981 uh, determined that uh, you know that their their land had been uh, illegally seized by the U.S. federal government, and you know for for four decades now they've been saying keep your money. And these are poor communities; they need the money. They're saying keep the money. We want the land, you know. And so we have to think about reparations in in terms of you know the, in terms of the land, in terms of what they can do for people emotionally and and psychologically. In terms of what they can do for society, can they actually help lift communities out of uh, widespread poverty? How much money would you need to interject into the Gaza Strip to make it functional economically? I don't know. I don't have the answer, but these are the questions that that we need to to ask. That you know that, and, and also we should be, I think, a little bit wary in the Palestinian context of of reparations because reparations in the Zionist mentality and Zionist logic means population transfers. You know, the most, one of the most violent, adamant Zionists of, of the 20th century, you know, Meyer Kahane, you know, and Kahane, by the way, uh, liberal Zionists absolutely detest him, not just for ideological reasons, but because he always, always poked at him saying, you know, such thing as Zionism and democracy, you people are deluding yourselves, you know, and he was right. <laughs> you know, you people are deluding yourselves. You either want Zionism or you want democracy. You can't have both. And they hated him. They hated him for that. But anyway, you know, we hate him too because, you know, he's, he's a violent terrorist, you know, um, an ethnic cleanser. But he always. But answered, I appreciate the truth telling. The truth telling is definitely good. And anything that helps us uh, throw it back into to liberal Zionist faces is, is okay by me. But he was an outspoken advocate of the transfer of the Arabs, the Palestinians, right? He called them Arabs. People would always clutch their pearls. How, how could you suggest such a thing? That's terrible. And he'd say, whoa, whoa, I'm not just going to kick them out. We should pay them, right? We should give them money. We should pay them for the right. And he meant it, right? We should pay them for their property. We should give them money, send them to Saudi Arabia, send them to Jordan, send them yeah. wherever the hell. But we're going to pay them. We're not just going to kick them out. We're not monsters. And so, again, I, I know that it's not necessarily what people think of when we say the word reparations. Yeah. But there are things that we ought to think about. That, yes. that there are some things about Palestine's national movement that money and property, physical property, I mean, simply can't solve right yeah. that there's a a physical geography a national property right that that has to be addressed that there's a, a homeland that we aspire to and you can't money cannot take the homeland out of people's hearts and souls it just can't you know and land is is even deeper than 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 career so even when i think about like what the loss of career has meant to me if somebody came to me 10 years ago and said look man I'm going to give you $5 million, which is much more than I got from the settlement. I'm going to give you $5 million, right? You leave academia and never go back. I would have said no. You know, and so what, what are you going to tell Palestinians in, in, in Shatila, in Lebanon, right? Or in the Gaza Strip or in the Haisha, you know, how, how much are you going to offer them to forget about Palestine? It, yeah, I mean, you're bringing up so many key points. And I think, you know, the reason I wanted to ask this question is because I think in activist discourse, sometimes we get this notion that reparations is, you know, is equivalent to justice. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally don't, don't feel like that, you know, at all. And when you gave the example of the Lakota saying, keep your money, we want our land. I felt that was a very Palestinian thing. I don't know any Palestinians who would accept money instead of being able to go back to their land and live on their land with full rights and dignity. Um, and you know the opportunity to 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 plan their lives like any other human being has the you know option to plan their lives in the way that they see fit. One of the most poignant examples of the Palestinian connection to land, even in exile, is probably the key. Many Palestinian families that were made refugees in 1948 and uh, later on have lived for generations in refugee camps, perhaps only hours away from their original homes, and they continue to hold their keys to their old houses, the keys and the land deeds. And, you know, the photograph of the Palestinian refugee holding the key has now become a common feature of art and, you know, photography exhibits about Palestine. In the Palestinian discourse, 
this attachment to the land often materializes also as a yearning for it and a speaking about a return. So this notion of the right of return. And, you know, we had Miko Pellet on the podcast two weeks ago, and he spoke to us about organizations that were working on the ground to plan for a practical return of Palestinians to Palestine. And he mentioned uh, the organization Zohrot, which is literally working to make this happen in a very practical way. Speak a little bit about how this attachment to land plays out in the, in the Native American discourse today. I mean, you gave the example of the Lakota, but you know, are there some that are saying, no, we, you know, we would take the money if it was offered to us. Are they living in, in a nostalgia for the past or are there also aspirations for and concrete attempts at forging a, a different future relationship with the land? Oh, in, in, in the Native context, it's very often, uh, you know, what you call practical. No, they, 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 they want the land back. The land philosophically and materially is, is really the basis of, of, Pretty much all native nationalisms, you know, on the continent, that they they're fighting for it back, uh, you know, through legal avenues and in other ways. Um, my colleague uh, Doug Keel, who who does native studies at, at Northwestern, has has written a lot about, and it's a fascinating process. He's he's a member of the Oneida tribe of Wisconsin, and he has sort of chronicled how they, you know. They've done a decades long, I don't, maybe more than a century long. I, I can't remember. I'm sorry, Doug. A, a process for you know how how they they've sort of built their traditional land base back, um, and they've done it through a, a variety of economic and and legal means. They bought some of it back. They won some of it back in court, but you know they they cobbled it all together, right? And and you know they're they're they're. They're now back in control of a, a, a decent uh, a amount of the land that was allocated to them, you know, when they, they were originally in, in what's now New York and, and, and a branch of the Oneida ended up in, in Wisconsin. But anyway, that sort of thing is happening all over the place. So you, you, you can't really make sense of Native national liberation movements without the concept of an autonomous land base. And it's it's my impression that the same pretty much holds in in Palestine or wherever else any any uh, indigenous decolonial movement is a, a foot that you, you, culture cannot exist right without an autonomous land base that you you know it can but you, you need an autonomous land base for the national community to survive and 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 thrive. It's kind of a, a precondition for. For liberation. So I would think that I got to spend some time in, in Lebanon over the past 20 years. And, you know, you, most of, of the Palestinians there um, that, that you'll encounter, the ones in, in the camps and even outside of the camps will tell you that, you know, getting rights, political rights and economic rights in, in Lebanon, of course, is a priority, but it's not the same kind of priority as going back home. Right, that you know, being comfortable where you currently exist, of course, is important, and of course, it's something you you fight for. But the land is more important in in the end, and not just you know the land as 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 individual tracts of private property, but land on which a nation can exist and on which it can grow. I want to add that I read the Cherokee Nation has a high propensity of lawyers and a high propensity of casino owners. So it seems like to some degree they have chosen the assimilate and get monetary compensation route. But I'm sure there are parts of the Cherokee Nation who adamantly refuse to participate. Uh, that said, there were a minority of native tribes who owned slaves. The Cherokee was one of them. And they managed to pay reparations to the enslaved people. And they also gave them citizenship within the Cherokee tribe. So if the Cherokees, who were themselves ethnically cleansed, can provide reparations, I think it's probably fair to say that the American government can too. Yeah, I mean, exactly. The American government can more or less do what it wants I always see people arguing about what's viable and not in the United States. And I always right. roll my eyes. Come on. It's a matter of, of will and desire. This the state, the government is calibrated, you know, towards enriching or further enriching the ruling class. It's not there to serve the people. You know, but people were arguing about trains the other day, like, oh, they, you know. You couldn't do that in the United States like you could in China. It's like, yes, you could. You could build whatever the 
you want in in the United States, right? Uh, the United States can put up military bases in like a hundred some different countries. Then the United States could build a high speed railroad track. You know, the United States could provide reparations. The United States could could have provided relief, COVID relief, in much much higher monetary numbers than than it did. You know, the, the United States chooses not to. Chooses to send is, four billion dollars to Israel every year instead. Exactly. The United States is spending all its money on on militarism and imperialism. You know, the United States, you know, they don't care about us. I, that's what people have to get. And I, this is a tangent. I apologize, but yeah, that's please what people, <laughs> political consumers need to get through their heads. That your representatives, right, the high level politicians, they don't give a shit about you. I know it's hard to believe. It's taken me years of, of having the evidence beaten over my head over and over and over again for me to acknowledge that because it hurts to acknowledge. It's painful, right? It, it, and it makes you think about politics differently in, in very difficult ways, but they don't care about you. It makes you view yourself differently, exactly. right? Because you see that you've been fooled. When mm -hmm. we talk about what's viable, right? If it's building the empire, that's viable. If exactly. It's take if it's taking care of anything that needs to get taken care of, well, that's a pie in the sky is what it is. <laughs> exactly. Who's going to pay for that? And yeah. You're going to pay for it. I, nobody asked me whether I wanted to pay for, for you know, Israeli's bombardment of Gaza. You know, uh, and, and it's just, it's not just that they don't care. It's just, it, it's a sensibility. They, they, the government is not the state, let's say. The state is not going to pay you reparations because it's the right thing to do. The state ain't going to give you health care because it's the right thing to do. The state ain't going to do shit because it's the right thing to do. You know, anything that you get from the state that you manage to extract from the state, it's because you develop enough power to make them, to force them make to make a concession. But nothing is going to happen out, out of a sense of moral obligation, right? It's, it's a power dynamic, and we have not. And we can get something from the state, right? just like Palestinians can get something from the from the Zionist state, only in relation to, to how much power that, that that we wield. And right now, the balance is very much not, not in our favor. You heard him, boys. It's a Molotov summer. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. Um, I want to go back to this this idea that that you just mentioned. Uh, when you were speaking about the Palestinians in the refugee camps in, in, in Lebanon, the idea that even if they were to achieve equal rights in Lebanon, that this would not be enough. And, you know, I find myself struggling with this often as an activist, because when I speak, I am at once calling for decolonization, but also equal rights, but also no to apartheid, but also no to, to discrimination, but also, you know, settler colonialism is bad. And it's like this mishmash of all these concepts, which are, you know, oppressive in their own way and all interact with one another. But I feel like I'm just, you know, throwing everything, you know, at the board and because I don't want to leave anything out because I know that it's all important. And I don't want to, you know, for example, call only for equal rights at the expense of liberation and decolonization, right? Right? and misrepresent the movement. So you write, for example, about how apartheid and settler colonialism in the Palestine discourse are often referred to as the same thing. And you caution against this because you say that the notion of indigeneity tends to vanish and the political goal for the indigenous gets envisioned as belonging within the nation state rather than as an acknowledgement of their distinct modes of sovereignty and self-definition. And it's true that we do hear apartheid and settler colonialism go you know, hand in hand in, in uh, Palestine solidarity. So can you... Tell us, what is the relationship between apartheid and settler colonialism? Apartheid, I mean, as a lawyer, I know that it's a legal definition. You know, it's a crime. It's a crime against humanity. It's been defined as such. And, you know, recently we've had uh, the benefit of, of, of several reports would have, which have come out and confirmed what we have all known for decades. You know, earlier this year, we had the Beit Salem report, which confirmed that Israel was guilty of the crime of apartheid. And just a few weeks ago, we had the Human Rights Watch report, of course, which confirmed the same thing. This, of course, is extremely obvious to anyone who's paying attention and, you know, Palestinians who have been saying it for decades. But even if you're part of the mainstream discourse, Jimmy Carter said it in 2006. So it's a little, you know, too little too late. But um but yeah, can you help clarify these concepts for us and, 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 and give us an idea of how we as activists should be calling for the liberation of Palestine? Sure. Really quickly, Lara is the type of person to ask a question and then define the answer for you. No, I didn't define it. I said I don't have a definition. 
<laughs> no, I asked about the relationship. I asked about the relationship. It's a oh, joke. Go community. ahead. Go oh, ahead. With your lawyer ass. Your lawyer <laughs> Lawyer. Lawyer. I, I actually wish, Lara, that you had defined it because I, I honestly don't have a good definition of apartheid. We, we know it from the South African context, as you said, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's more complicated, I guess, than people see, but... In terms of how the the word connotes in everyday political discourse, right? We just, we kind of think of, of apartheid not in its in that specific legal dimension, but we just we, we we see it as segregation, formalized segregation, akin to Jim Crow. So what's happening in in Palestine is is it's it's like Jim Crow, the Jim Crow South in the U.S. It's like apartheid. It's not identical to either. You know, there there are significant differences, but conceptually i think that's what people are getting at when when they use apartheid i know human rights watch and other groups are are an amnesty and others are concerned with the legal definition as, as they should be but um in everyday usage in non-professional usage i think people use apartheid really as, as synonymous with segregation with with formal segregation or with legal segregation you know what one, one group's getting a, a set of rights that the other group is not getting, or even at the expense of, of another group. And I think that's how most people understand the term. And, it, you know, in turn, thinking of, of you know, what, what we can do as activists, you know, vis-a-vis -vis terms like apartheid and settler colonization, you know, we, we can think of what, what an equally vexing term means, equal rights. So... What happens if the 1948 Palestinians, you know, the ones with Israeli papers, get a set of rights that that are, you know, that the Palestinians in the West Bank or in East Jerusalem don't have? Then, of course, what if the they get a set of rights in the West Bank that doesn't attend to the Palestinians, you know, in Lebanon, right? Who have no rights whatsoever anywhere, and so it, it gets complicated. But I like to put the the land base into the center of the equation and, and what we want more than anything because the complexities can be worked out afterwards is a return to the land and a right to exist on the land as equal citizens not at anybody else's expense right but at the expense really of all the injustice that we've had to endure for over a century now that's that's what we want in the end so people like zionists will come at the notion of the right of return and a lot of arabs so you know pragmatic arabs will say bah, you know the palestinians ain't going anywhere the palestinians in jordan you know they have citizenship you know they're part of the the jordanian state blah 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 you know the palestinians in syria aren't going anywhere you know the palestinians in the u.s aren't returning to palestine don't be silly and that's the wrong way to look at it right okay we know why Zionists are saying that, but from the Arab point of view, right, with people who, who at least uh, nominally support uh, the right of return but don't think that it's viable. Well, first of all, how do you know what people are going to do and not do? I mean, seven years ago, I, 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 you know, I wasn't thinking about moving to Palestine, but now, shit, man, I'd move to Palestine if it was free. I'm not even lying. If I had a right of return, I would exercise it. I would go. I would get my Arabic good, Same. right? You know, exactly, right? I would go. I would make a life there. I would raise my kid there. I, I, you know, maybe I would be happy there. Maybe I wouldn't, but I would have the right. So first of all, the, the decisions about going and staying are temporal, but they're even besides the point. We're talking about a right, you know. I don't exercise all of the rights that I have as a U.S. citizen, <laughs> but I have them. Yeah. You know, less so by by the month it seems, but anyway, that's besides the point. The the <laughs> right. we we have the right to return, and it's not for anybody sitting in an office on some stuffy ass campus, you know, in the United States to decide what what rights others that they don't even know are or aren't going to to exercise. So when we're talking about you know. What we might do as activists or writers or intellectuals or however you want to identify yourself, it's it's that we want to create as much possibility as we can. We never want to limit the range of, of our desire based on our rightful historical claims, that we don't just concede things 
you know, for the sake of, of the, the colonizers sense of pragmatism, that it ain't the colonizers worry whether the people, the Palestinians in Jordan will go back home or not. That's not your concern. And, and nobody gave you the right to speak for them. Right. Uh, nobody gave you the right to speak for me or for Lara. We go if we want to go, if that right exists. But I'm not going to consult you. Right. I have the right. <laughs> the point is, don't concede anything. Don't concede right. anything, but, but, you know, uh, before the struggle has even started. Right? We, we, we're so far from a, a so-called solution that you don't you don't concede. You don't don't concede any of, of the rights to which you're aspiring, that they're yours. They're a possession, right? They might be a possession without legal substance, but that doesn't mean they're unimportant. Right? They're still an important possession because they are part of who you are. Right? They're a part of something that was passed on to you by your ancestors and something that you want to pass on to your own descendants. I didn't really answer your question. I'm sorry, but I, oh, I, I, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, you did in a way because I think I mean, if I'm hearing you correctly, what you're what you're saying is that we should almost insist on the settler colonial framework, right? Because that's yes. the framework that connects us to the land. I mean, apartheid can be practiced yes. in areas where there is no settler colonialism, right? Yes. And so the rights that arise out of being indigenous to the land and having a connection to the land and having my grandparents born on that land can yes. only be exercised if I'm speaking about what's happening in Palestine from a settler colonial framework and then saying, and I have the right to return because you made me a refugee and, you know, under international law, refugees have the right to return. So it's these two elements, this, this notion of settler colonialism, but also not conceding the right to return before we ever get anywhere, I think yeah. are the two main ideas that I, that I took from your answer. Yeah, no, you're you're a perceptive listener. That's that's what I should have said. But yeah, I, I like the settler colonial framework. I've had some pushback, friendly pushback, from mm. you know Palestinian leftists who are a little bit skeptical of of the framework of settler colonization. They're more interested in a sort of a class slash imperialism framework, which I think is deeply important as well. And also, the term decolonization has gotten a little bit silly. In, in public usage over, over the past few years. But in the end, I, I think that settler colonialism is not only useful politically, I think it's the most historically accurate framework that, that we can apply for, for you know, the, the best possible understanding of what's happened and what's happening now. You actually preempted one of my questions because I was going to ask you, is decolonization the goal and what does decolonization look like in Palestine? It is. I'm, I I haven't fully given up on the word. I mean, I wrote an entire book using the word, you know, so I, I have right. a long relationship with it. And <laughs> you have a vested interest in how this turns out exactly. <laughs> in terms I'm of your not, legacy. <laughs> exactly. I'm not ready to, to, to give it away, but uh, it, it, it does have still usage. But everything in the public discourse that gets taken up you know, by a wide range of people ends up kind of with a silly usage. You know, that, that doesn't mean that, that we should throw out the concept. Because the way I've always used decolonization, or have tried to use it anyway, is, is fundamentally anti-imperialist, is, is fundamentally anti-capitalist. Um, you know, I'm, I, would, I don't know how I would identify, but certainly as anti-capitalist, right? Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm somewhere on the socialist co communist spectrum, which, you know, just so people will know kind of where I'm positioned um, um, politically and thinking about these things. I, I've always thought of, of, of decolonization as, as Fanon and others thought of it too, as not just a, a economic or a, a political process, but it's a psychological process, ridding the, the vestiges of, of the, the colonizers imposition from our brains making sure that we're not internally colonized, that we're not just uh, mimicking, you know, our, our conquerors talking points back to him. That That's what decolonization means to me, not just in a Palestine context, but in any context. It's not just uh, legal freedom. It's not just uh, land back. It's psychological and spiritual freedom as well. Yeah. In fact, in internationalism, you, you do cite to Franz Fanon. And uh, Franz Fanon, of course, provides what you say is the most famous theory of decolonization in The Wretched of the Earth. And according to Fanon, you write, the colonial entity must be rejected completely, subverted, dismantled, decentralized, in other words, disordered. You go on to refer to decolonization as a historical process, as the encounter between two congenitally antagonistic forces that in fact owe their singularity to the kind of reification that was nurtured by the colonial situation. 
So if I follow Fanon's description that decolonization is inevitable because once it is described, it is activated and thus becomes irreversible, is the process of decolonization, has it already begun in Palestine? Have we already started the process of decolonizing Palestine without even realizing it? Because we are having these conversations about decolonization. And, you know, on this point that you made about decolonization also having this psychological component, a psychological rejection. If it's one thing that I think Palestinians, especially the grassroots, the civil society, the people are so good at, it is this psychological rejection of Zionism and the colonial entity. And we've had this um, historically uh, since the beginning of British colonialism in Palestine. Mm -hmm. Agree. I I think the, the I think the process of Palestinian decolonization started at the same moment as Zionist colonization. I really do. I think it's always been in existence. I think it's it's a fundamental part of the culture and society and has been for a very long time. It's expressed in different ways. We di- we disagree, you know, it, uh, on certain aspects of of what it means to 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 resist, uh, you know, to to aspire to freedom, but I would argue that Palestinian decolonization began the moment that Palestinians refused to adhere to their destiny as it was imposed on them by the Zionists. Right? That's that's when decolonization began, and you can really trace it. It's, it would be interesting actually to do a kind of timeline, but you know the 1936 to 1939 revolt, um, but before that the clashes in Khalil and Hebron, you know, in the 1920s, the earliest Zionist writers, uh, who, European Jews who went to Palestine, you know, in, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. I've been I've been reading a lot of that stuff recently and posting some of my findings on Twitter because I find it fascinating. But even they're noticing what we would call or what we might conceptualize as elements of decolonization in the, the native population they encounter. They always call Palestinians the native population. Right. Which- Actually, Thank quite you. helpful for us now, right? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. They knew, and they, you know, they they weren't under any illusions, like like the Zionists today are. But they're always noting that, you know, they're wary of us, they're suspicious of us. They'll accommodate us and welcome us to the degree that we don't take that we don't attempt to take their place in society. Well, okay, that's a decolonial sensibility right there. Have you heard of Jakob de Haan? Yes, that's I haven't read it, him yet. Yeah. Yeah, he he's the the other Jakob that I wish people knew more about uh because <laughs> he went to settle in Palestine from the Netherlands and spoke about it as Palestine, talked about how his life would be totally different because mm-hmm. he was a well-established poet in the Netherlands and he was going to be working on a farm in Palestine. He also went to speak out against the establishment of a Zionist state but was assassinated by the Haganah outside of his place of worship in Jerusalem. Wow. Is native support for Palestine a new phenomenon? Or do we see examples of it going back, you know, 70, 80, 100 years ago to the beginning of Palestinian resistance against British and Zionist colonization? And can you provide some examples? People like Nick Estes and and Melanie Yazzie and others, the research much more carefully than I have since I'd last published my book. I'm not really familiar with the literature pre-1960. So I'm, I'm familiar with what happens in the 1960s and beyond. But there are a lot of Christians in Native communities who, 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 who believe in the idea of, you know, uh, Israel's special place in, in the Holy Land, right? You see that in, in different Christian, particularly Protestant communities around the world. And so you're going to get a mixed reaction from Natives about Palestine. But I will say that those who are politically conscious in a, in a certain way, those who have, have taken up a certain understanding of, of settler colonization and resistance to settler colonization generally tend to be sympathetic to Palestinians. I've met a lot of natives over the years um, that didn't really know much about Palestine one way or the other. They, they defaulted to what could be called a pro-Israel position simply simply because of of religion or simply because it was the mainstream position and they didn't know anything else. And I've had the opportunity to sort of explain some of Palestine's history to them. And they've turned around their thinking and said, oh, you know, I I had no idea that that happened. That's messed up. You know, count me in. And and so it depends really on who you're talking to. 
where you're speaking with them. Let's say in, in the spaces that I've been familiar with in you know, the, the past 20 years of my life, uh, academic activist spaces, that there's a pretty strong commitment to, to, you know, to Palestinian liberation. They're natives. I have taken delegations to, to Palestine and have uh, written beautifully about it, about their experiences there. And they're, the connections between the U.S. as a settler colonial state and Israel as a settler colonial state are really, really difficult to overlook or forget about once you start putting their 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 statements side by side. If Zionist mythologies are sound deeply familiar to the American ear, right? They also sound deeply familiar in a different way to the Native Americans' ear. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I just think about how so much of our national identity, our culture has really over the decades become sort of synonymous with resistance. And so I think if Native people start to learn about Palestinian culture, then they will immediately see something that is shared and common. You know, so many of our folkloric songs, our poetry, our literature, it's about exile, it's about identity, it's about freedom and dignity and land and humanity and these big ideas which then become sort of synonymous with Palestinianness. And so I think that's something that could resonate with native communities because you know for them it's 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 a lot of the same ideas that show up. You see that with Palestine all over the indigenous world or the global south. And yeah. it's one of the, the most fascinating things about Palestine to me that you know people always wonder why do people care so much about Palestine and i don't know there are a million different answers you know you could say maybe the whole holy land mythos etc cetera, etc cetera. but at the same time because Palestine has always been you know a, a deeply feeling fundamental feature of liberation movements the world over and wherever you find people who are interested in in national liberation or in indigenous liberation then then you're going to find a consciousness about Palestine one that that I, I you know I think it's important for Palestinians to reciprocate yes absolutely so in your book internationalism you explore the concepts of settler colonialism and indigeneity and state violence through the lenses of the palestinian and native american experiences and in doing so you articulate this theory of internationalism which you write demands commitment to mutual liberation based on the proposition that colonial power must be rendered diffuse across multiple hemispheres through reciprocal struggle you also write that the age of transnational humanities has arrived no longer can scholars demarcate territories of intellectual pursuit based on the self-contained logic of linear group identity. So for our listeners who may be new to this idea, why is internationalism essential for every scholar or activist working on the issue of Palestinian liberation? And what does it look like in practice? Hey, uh, it's, it's a variation of the old uh, Marxist notion of, of internationalism that we, we have class interests that that are transnational and that we we can and should connect around them it was, it was taken up by a lot of the third world or global south liberation movements you know throughout the 20th century that then the way i'm using it is, is is specifically in regard to indigenous communities communities that are suffering ongoing forms of settler colonization that's a category in which palestinians and natives both fit and what i'm i'm trying to urge people to to look at is the way that the colonial power itself is transnational that israel doesn't survive without the aid of the united states right that israel is is not only an ally of the united states but israel is a client of the united states and so we we can't limit our understanding of Palestinian dispossession simply to the Zionist entity, that there, there's a, a broader framework there. There's a framework that includes uh, European imperial power, uh, Canadian imperial power, but especially American imperial power. And so we ought to look at then what other forces in the world are pressing against that same side of power that's responsible for our own oppression. And in the United States, the two most obvious answers, of course, are African Americans and, and Native Americans, a whole bunch of other answers. But Native Americans provide a, a, a really interesting site of, of comparative political work 
not simply because they're they're sort of uh, in large part, uh, you know, the victims of uh, the primary victims or one of the primary victims of U.S. settler colonization, but because they exist in the same international class stratum as Palestinians, right? As dispossessed colonized subjects. And based on, on that connection alone, it's valuable to, important, essential really, to explore possibilities of connection, uh, possibilities of comparison, you know, possibilities of mutual aid, whatever you want to call it. But I would say that that's insofar as the Palestine Solidarity Movement, you know, in its North American branch, I would say that it's not only important, but necessary. So I take, you know, I guess we both grew up in the United States, Larry, you and I, yeah. um, and, and Michael as well, that we're we're interested in, in Palestine solidarity. We're interested in liberating Palestine. Well, we have an example of settler colonization right here in our own country, right? We have an example of indigenous communities um, fighting against the colonial power. And so I would say that that it's, it's essential that we get involved in that and that we make ourselves available to help those movements as well. We, we have the same sort of obligation as it's not just a political quid pro quo, but it's a sensibility, a sensibility of what we want the world to look like. And we're going to apply that standard wherever it is that, that, that we happen to be, whether it's in Palestine or, or in the United States or in Canada. You point to Native and Indigenous support for BDS as a quintessential form of internationalism. And you also cite to the Palestinian support for Native American-led resistance against the Dakota Access Pipeline, for example, and other attempts to seize land and resources by uh, the powers that be and continue to disenfranchise and dispossess natives today of, of their land. You've also argued that BDS has a particular responsibility to American decolonization and that mm -hmm. for the native, they can participate in BDS, not merely to resist Israeli colonization, but also to affirm American decolonization. Exactly. That's my suggestion for, for taking up BDS or any other activist work in general. That again, that it be applied somehow beyond its its what we imagine to be its most immediate concern. So BDS is is a terrific way to get oneself involved in decolonization in, in, in North America because it's putting forward a kind of tactic that's transferable to other geographies and other political situations. You know, and it gives us an opportunity to to learn and to be in communication. How many, I don't, I don't know, this is, a, this is a rhetorical question, but how many Palestinian Americans are aware of, of you know, the, the struggle by uh, the Kanaka Maoli, the Hawaiians, you know, to preserve Mauna Kea, a sacred site that they want to build a 30 meter telescope there and they oppose it, the, the native Hawaiians oppose it. Take it from a BDS point of view. Okay, I'm interested in, in BDS against Israel. All right, well, how does that concern travel? What other places can it go to? How can I enliven my understanding of Palestine by putting myself in a position to learn more about other struggles, about mutual struggles of people outside the community that I identify with and, and be useful to them as a way, not, not, not only of being useful, of, of being a good ally or whatever you want to call it, but also of, of refocusing my commitment to Palestine's liberation as well. These are mutual exchanges. See, again, I always go back to they're not they're not quid pro quo. They're not supposed to be for convenience. They're not you know calculated transactions. They're the ways of constantly reinvigorating ourselves and doing it through contact and community with others. And that's really, in my mind, the only way that that somebody can keep their energy up. And, and keep their mind fresh and, and keep their motivation strong is by constantly being reinvigorated by contact with others and through service, you know, to other communities who are going through forms of, of oppression that not only that, that we find legible, but that we refuse to tolerate, that we won't countenance, that we want to eliminate because we don't see any place for those sorts of things in the world. Yeah, the activist burnout is real. Yes. Very. Yeah. I don't even want to ask you how many times you've burnt out. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm burnt out right now. You're burnt I, out right I, now. 
Oh, I don't mean from the interview. I mean, in general, yeah. like I, I haven't, I mean, I have to be honest here. Yeah. I spent a lot of my time writing, but I haven't been involved in a, in a BDS a action in quite a while. It's been right. a while. I'll, I'll go back to it one day. I like your idea about building sustainability through community and allyship, which is not for convenience sake, but it is, it, it, it is just necessary. Yes. Yeah. About two years ago, I went to Hawaii. I didn't get to stay long. I, I got to to see the U.S. military installations there, and 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 be in in contact in community with various uh, Kanaka activists and and intellectuals. And I came back more motivated than I have ever right. been. Just it was like wow, you know, Hawaii is in my heart. It's in my head, and now I just. I want to just do work. Do you know what I mean? And 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 that's what I'm talking yeah. about. You know, and when when people get it, but it happens both ways too. Like, how many people do we know right, who've gone to Palestine on yes. a delegation, right? And they come back and they're like, "Damn, you know, let's, yeah. let's get to it." Mm-hmm. Yes, right? that's that's the wonderful thing. So in internationalism, you also speak about the devastating impact of Israel's neoliberal policies outside of Palestine. And I think this is something that we don't often talk about when we're doing strictly Palestinian solidarity work. We might talk about it if we're engaged in broader conversations on empire and neoliberalism and, you know, these sorts of ideologies. So in the book, I think you mention uh, the state's contribution to repression and genocide of the indigenous peoples in Guatemala and in El Salvador in the 1980s. And in last week's episode, we touched on how Israel provided weapons and training to Mexico in the... But uh, can you speak a little bit about the ways in which Israel's repressive policies extend beyond the borders of Palestine? I'm glad you brought that up. That's yeah. an important point. I mean, first of all, the... Yes, Zionism is primarily a, a Palestinian concern. Palestinians have been its primary victims, etc. But I, it it always makes me a little bit sad to to see, you know, that it gets exclusivized to to Palestinians. Right? I always thought of Zionism really as an as an Arab concern, you know, and and I hope it remains that way, especially with all the normalization efforts that that. Are going on, but I never want um, you know Israel and Zionism, you know, just just to be limited to Palestinians because it's affected the entire region. It's affected more than two continents, and so immediately, of course, Lebanon and Syria. Israel is, is has been bombing Syria regularly for for some years now. So Israel is engages in acts of of aggression against all of its neighbors. It's not just um, the the Palestinians, although it's primarily the Palestinians. So there's that. That's that's one way in which you know it, it, it moves beyond its its own immediate borders. But I, I like the example that you brought up of Central America and Mexico. That it, I would uh, advise or urge your readers to look up uh, Guatemala, especially and General Rios Montt. Um, that's M O N T T. Give him a Google and Google Israel and Ariel Sharon along with him, and you're gonna find some extremely ugly stuff that not only did Israel help fund a genocide against indigenous Guatemalans in the 1980s and 1990s, but Israel helped provide logistical support. Israel provided training. You know, you, you could say that Israel was just as responsible for that genocide as the Guatemalan government, the United States as well, of course. Israel similarly intervened in El Salvador during the same period. So in Central America in the 80s and 90s, really for longer, uh, in Nicaragua as well, there were uh, a bunch of civil wars and, and conflicts. The United States was knee deep into it because our communist rebels, in some cases, were beginning to win power. And, and so it was an important uh, site of the Cold War. Reagan was obsessed with uh, Central America and uh, Israel ended up uh, lending a tremendous hand to the United States. And it's not just in, in Central America yeah, during the Cold War. There's an old book by Benjamin Beit Halahmi called Who Israel Funds and Why. He was an old Israeli a psychiatrist. It's it's a great old book. It was It's old now, probably 30, 35 years old. I don't know if it's been updated since then, but you know, it's it's eye opening. But wherever, basically, the the general rule of thumb, and it almost always holds, is that if there is a force of reaction somewhere in the world right, that is is in conflict with a force of of progressiveness, right, then you can almost be assured that Israel is going to be somehow on the side of reaction. Right? That it's going to be funding it 
or that it's going to be philosophically supportive of it, wherever, wherever there's, there's a movement towards socialism or, or towards equality or towards some kind of political system, right? That's going to take uh, resources out of the hands of the ruling class and give it to the people. And then the people are going to be able to make their own decisions. You can bet your ass that the United States is going to be against it, right? And what the United States is against, Israel is going to be against as well. And, you know, for people who think that Israel is useless to the United States, do some research on, on how often Israel helps carry the U.S.'s dirty water in these sorts of interventions, right? The Mossad does a lot of this work. Uh, the IDF does a lot of this work. And so it's it's not just the United States, it's the United States and its client states, you know, that that engage in in imperialism. So that's that's kind of the 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 general metric that that I use. If is if is a group running afoul of US imperial designs, then I just wanted to add that in the book, you provide the example of the chief of staff of the Guatemalan army in the 1980s, who said that the Israeli soldier was the example for the Guatemalan soldier. And in 1982, the president of Guatemala said that the success of the army was due to the fact that the Guatemalan army was trained by Israel. Exactly. Yep. The evidence is there. I mean, Mont got got uh, got convicted of, of war crimes. So all of the, all of the documents are freely available on the Internet. And, and it's extremely ugly reading. All right. Well, we can't end on that. <laughs> Jesus Christ. We got to do something else. <laughs> yeah. I think that's actually one of the things that I wanted to mention when I was researching you, just how admirable you were in how you handled everything. You never once ceded any ground. Like you said earlier, you stood your ground completely because you knew that you had objectively moral and correct inspirations. And so I just wanted to ask, because you went through such a tumultuous event, sort of, these are the type of events that reveal who people can truly count on, right? They push you to be a better version of yourself. And so what would you say was the most valuable lesson that you learned from going up against the Zionist lobby? And was there anybody in your life who surprised you with their reaction? Okay, well, that that second question is good. I'm gonna have to think on that for a second. No, honestly, nobody comes to mind immediately. Um, but maybe in a second, maybe I'll. Michael's have to trying to turn this podcast into a gossip column. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, mean, I don't blame him. That that, that it make, it makes tell us something. Tell us something juicy. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to dish. Um, you might as well have like just asked me to to go on a tangent that that's never gonna end because I have a. a lot of thoughts about that that please in so many ways my political identity is 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 attached to that experience and how i reacted to it you, you know it's like it's hard as we you know i'm I, I guess i'm in middle age now but as you're growing into middle age i don't know even in, back in high school trying to figure out what your role in the world is going to be and that, that's a constant question for us and i i've I've come to understand that really that, that my role in this movement more than anything is, is going to be having never given an inch. And it's a role that I'm, I'm proud of and that I'll, you know, and if that's, that's the, the reputation that, that I leave behind, then I'll end up being pleased with what I've done. I often get myself in trouble with, you know, with would-be friends and colleagues on social media and elsewhere, they always say that I'm too harsh or too stubborn or, you know, then they throw out like dumb liberal terms like purist and, and this and that. But it's like, I don't care if it's, I don't care if it's Bernie Sanders. I don't, I don't care if it's Joe Biden. I don't yeah. care who it is. It's AOC. I don't care if it's AOC. Like if that Twitter war that broke out. Yeah. I'm, you know, if they're talking nonsense about Palestine, then I'm going to yeah. say something. I'm not the point. I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you what to do. I've never told anybody how to behave politically. That's not my style. I don't even really care. You go yeah. vote for who you want, campaign for who you want. I don't care. But the moment that people right, are, are fundamentally going to try to subsume Palestine's national liberation movement to, you know, an electoral movement in the, the U S then I'm, I'm going to object to it. I'm, I'm going to object to anything that doesn't take seriously or doesn't acknowledge the existence of a national liberation movement on its own terms. 
on terms that, that, that come out of Palestinian society and not out of the, the logic of, of electoralism or Western diplomacy or, or, or whatever you have, whatever you have in, in Europe or, or North America. And that's, that's kind of where I, I think that's of a piece with, with my attitude about like the whole Illinois thing that it's just, and then everything that came after that sometimes you just have to take the punishment. It's unjust, it's unfair, it sucks, but sometimes you have to take the punishment. Somebody's got to, right? And a lot of people don't even have the choice. Palestinians, you know, taking the punishment every damn day. You know, they can't opt out. You know, so I, I, I don't find it convincing. I just don't. Again, I'm not trying to argue with people or be purist, but when, when somebody make an excuse for a politician by saying, well, they, they need to do it to get reelected, well, who, why should their re-election be our concern? That's my whole point. I understand. You know, I understand that they're, I understand why they're doing what they're doing. I understand the motivation. I simply don't accept it. You know, I, I don't accept AOC becoming a bumbling liberal Zionist because she has to worry about Nancy Pelosi. Right. I don't have to worry about Nancy Pelosi. Right. You know what I mean? So I'm worried about Palestine. Right. So the AOC is going to choose to worry about Nancy Pelosi more than she's going to choose to care about Palestine. Yeah. All right. Then I'm I'm not I'm not going to run interference for AOC. You know, you can. That's fine. But but the, I guess the point I'm trying to make in my clunky, over exaggerated way is that we're constantly being asked or forced to make compromises on Palestine, and once you're aware. Of it, right? Once you know, it's like it's like seeing a particular model of red car. You know, you buy one, then all of a sudden you start seeing it everywhere. Once you're aware of of the compromises that we're constantly being coerced into making by the logic of U.S. exceptionalism and U.S. electoralism, right? And and once you decide, I'm I'm not going to concede to those forms of coercion anymore, then the U.S. political system becomes horribly difficult. And depressing, and you're gonna get punished. You'll get punished over and over. You get punished by friends. You'll get disciplined by friends. You'll get told, you know, you you get called things that 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 I don't consider kind, right? but uh, you know that that are that are part of I guess the political banter. Mm -hmm. But in the end, we don't have to make excuses for anybody who chooses to compromise on Palestine. There's a logic that, that underlies that kind of impulse that simply doesn't make any sense to me. And I'd like to see it from the point of view of Palestinians. I refuse to say anything in front of somebody in the United States that I wouldn't also be comfortable saying to somebody in the Gaza Strip, right? If, if I wouldn't say it to somebody in Gaza, I ain't saying it in front of you on Twitter. Right. So, you know, take it or leave it. But in, in the end, it's all a matter of, of, of where your ultimate devotion is. Is it to, to the Palestinian people? Is it to the National Liberation Movement? Or are you interested in, in, in pleasing a bunch of uh, functionaries and, and bureaucrats in the United States? You know, make your choice, do your thing, but don't come at the, those of us, you know, who, 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 refuse to accept that compromise is the cost of doing business. And not only do the Zionists not cede in their arguments or their land offers, they gobble up more land and they populate the internet with false narratives to distort the truth. Exactly. So they, they are not ceding. And neither should we. <laughs> that's exactly right. And that's the thing. It's supposed to be the realistic position or the pragmatic position. And that kills me. It's like, you know, we're supposed to be, you know, scientific minded. Where the hell is the evidence that this has ever worked? Actually, all the evidence is against us. It's actually never worked in all the <laughs> times that we have conceded on record. Exactly. You know, it's boring. It's dull. And, and it just doesn't, doesn't work. You know, at least in this way. You know, you get to maintain that 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 sense of dignity, right? That yes. that that's been passed along. Right? That's and rooted that, in principle. Exactly. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I I also am very unimpressed with this tendency to applaud for crumbs. 
right? Um, but I think it, it for a lot of people, it, it, it doing this work, it comes from this idea that we're so used to a discourse, which is so profoundly against us, that whenever we do get anything, it's, it becomes a reason and a cause for celebration. And I mean, I, I'm even guilty of it sometimes too. We had an episode a couple of weeks ago talking about the HR 2590, the new bill that was proposed mm -hmm. by Representative Benny McCollum. And here I am talking about how, you know, it's a monumental bill, but it's like on whose terms? Yeah, it might be monumental from the perspective of the imperialist, expansionist United States, but it's not going to liberate Palestine. Right. I mean, it's right. the bare minimum. I mean, she, right. right now it's got 18 co-sponsors and we can't even get the majority of Democrats on board to agree that it's a bad idea to steal land, lock up kids and build settlements, which are illegal, according to the United States itself, you know, pre-Trump. Right. I mean, this is what we're celebrating, you know, I'm but I, but I'm also guilty. I have to be critical of myself because... I want to be like you're saying, I want to be rooted in principle only, and I don't want to applaud for crumbs, and I don't want to make excuses for AUC. You know, that was the impulse of some of the Palestinian activists who, in response to her, you know, bumbling word salad, came out and said, here's the laundry list of all the great things she's done for Palestine. Where's your dignity? Yeah. And they also left off that she voted yes on the extra $500 million to go to Israel during the pandemic. They they were like, we judge her based on her actions, and she has co-sponsored this bill that will likely die in committee. But she did vote yes on yeah. extra aid for Israel. And that's why she's a fan of the Palestinian. That's why she is a proponent of Palestinian yeah. justice. And I was like, mm. yeah, that's gotta be that's gotta be yucky to type out. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it was like a tweet thread, Michael. I'll have to send it to you. I saw it. No, it I saw not, it. Okay, yeah, it was not good. No, it was not good, but it, it, it's complicated, okay? Like, it, yes. it's because I, I like take McCollum's bill. I yeah. actually wrote like a, a, an article favorable to it. I, I read it, yeah. Lie. I was impressed. Yeah. It, you know, because you're so article. used, you're so used to how how low the standard is in the U.S. Exactly. But I read the document. The bill is good. Like, yes. you know, it's of course it's not going to liberate Palestine. Let's 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 be real here, right? But. As a, as a document that exists in the context of the U.S. government, she did a good job with it, yes. right? She put her more leftist colleagues to shame, right? There's nobody like Betty McCollum who is, is putting forward that language on Palestine. And I think the squad and everybody else ought to be embarrassed. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think the bill uses it, terms right? like colonialism. Yeah. He uses terms like apartheid. He uses strong terms. So a lot of activists, you know, uh, lawyers, etc., you know, uh, worked hard to get to that point. And yes. I want to, you know, I want to acknowledge and, and honor their label, labor there. You know, they, they did a lot of great work pushing it. Do I think that, that anything is going to come of it? No, but not now. Maybe later. I don't know. But the point is, I'm, I'm not going to crap all over their efforts. I'm going to applaud and say good job. You know, uh, that that's admirable work that you've done. And it, it's it, and I don't want to give people the impression that, that, that I think we should just constantly be recalcitrant. I don't think that's useful. Right. That's healthy. Um, we, we, we can celebrate all kinds of things, big and small. But I guess what bothers me is that there's a structure and a system of rewards that comes along with making those compromises that people seem attracted to. And part of the process always seems to be doing it by stepping on the necks of those who are to your left in the Palestine solidarity movement. And I really do not like, whether it's Wajahat Ali or you know anybody else, I do not like anybody using my neck as a careerist footstool and people do that to palestinians all the time and it infuriates me it's like i do not exist for you you know to 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 suck up to the white man find somebody else for that in fact find an entirely different people for that just leave palestinians out of it and and th that's something that infuriates me and there's this impulse also that, that goes along with all of the accommodation that they make for U.S. exceptionalism to happily collect the rewards that, that come along with certain forms of, of acquiescence. And that's I, that's generally where I, I draw the line. Like I said, somebody's going to be punished. You know, you don't need to go around chasing rewards. Some people said, keep the land, I'll take the money. <laughs> <laughs>
I, I need I need I need you to teach me how to to be concise. I go on these long rambles, then you'll like bust out one line, and it's like, oh yeah, that's what I meant. That's <laughs> the comedian part. That's what the comedian is good for, right? Right. Tell us about what you're hopeful for. Tell us about the projects that you're working on. Tell us about what makes you happy today. I, I appreciate it. Those are those are lovely questions. I don't know. I <laughs> that, that, that's that, that's not my answer. I do. <laughs> I don't know how to say it without oh. being corny. Maybe Have you that's considered a, a career in comedy, Steve? Oh my gosh. I'm keeping that in for sure. <laughs> I don't know how to say it without sounding corny. I get I get joy from hanging out with my wife and son, uh, going to soccer practice with them. When my wife gets off work and, and taking a walk with her, it gives me tremendous joy and a tremendous sense of peace. Reading books with my kid. I just, I love... My family life is 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 essential to me. I read all the time. I, I just I consume novels and sometimes historical slash scholarly books at a at a pretty rapid pace, and I get you know tremendous in, enjoyment or at least a, a sense of satisfaction from that. And I write a lot. I've been working on some huge writing projects that that have. I don't know what's going to happen to them. I don't know where they're going to go, but they've they've kept me really busy and without. Without a, a, a writing project, then I'm a pretty useless human being. I like to to make sure that you know I'm doing something that's that's stimulating in a good way, whether it's, it's writing or reading or or just you know taking a bike ride, whatever. I, I've learned that it's smart to get off social media because like, a certain feeling creeps up, like a very distinct kind of frustration, like oh gosh, not this shit again, yeah. right? And and you know it's like okay, okay, right there, take a break. You know, yeah. move away from it. Go, go, go. Do something useful with yourself besides get, getting uh, frustrated or, or getting upset by by something that you have absolutely no control over. I was going to ask, uh, what is the the big writing project that you're working on? Can you give us a little insight, or is it a secret? Who's gossipy <laughs> now? <laughs> <laughs> Ever since the the pandemic started, I've been writing novels. It's really been wonderful the process, and I'm super happy with with what I've done. But, but more than anything, I'm doing it to keep myself um, sane and to keep myself focused, and you know, just to produce stories that that I think are are interesting, and and I hope they are. And one of these days, one way or the other, I'll get them into readers' hands. Oh, know, I would love to. I would love, love, love to see what what your writing looks like as as a novelist. Yeah, I'm 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 going to try to get them out there one way or another. Oh, that's but. so exciting. Are your characters Palestinian, or is it totally outside of the scope? Mostly outside of the scope. It's there implicitly. Yeah, you know? okay. I, I, I made a conscious decision that I didn't want to write what can be categorized as a political novel, okay. per se. Steve, thank you so much for coming on the show. You are a principled man who's clearly driven by the work, and I admire and respect everything that you've done. I have to say, your work as a scholar activist inspires me so much as a lawyer activist. I always tell people I'm a lawyer activist. I, I represent refugees, Palestinian and Syrian uh, asylum seekers in France in, in their uh, asylum applications and proceedings before French jurisdictions. And, you know, people always ask, oh, well, you're a lawyer. Are you an activist? No, I'm a lawyer activist. Just, you know, like right. Steve Slide is a scholar activist. Our, our professions are not separate from our commitment to justice. Exactly. And in fact, our commitment to justice is what informs our, you know, paths in this world. So, Thank you so much for, for forging that path and for, for being a great example for, for us Palestinians in the diaspora. Well, thank you both. That, it's, it's been a pleasure. Thank you all so much for listening to another episode of the Palestine Pod. You can find out more information at www.palestinepod.com. You can also email us at palestinepod at gmail.com. And go ahead and leave us a review. Subscribe, all of that YouTube jazz. And we will see you on the next episode of the Palestine Pod. It's the Palestine Pod. Palestine Pod. Palestine Pod. Sit back and relax. Palestine Pod. Something. Palestine Pod. Expand your mind. Palestine Pod. Oh, yeah, sorry. I have, I have so many of these <clears throat> ambulances. So I'm recording it's this. It's like we we truly love that people are getting taken care of. We do love that, if, but not at the expense of the podcast, honestly. Let them die. <laughs>